Good morning, beloved of God. Welcome to the Kent United Church of Christ, an open and affirming and accessible to all congregation, where we wholeheartedly proclaim whoever you are, wherever you are on your life's journey, you are welcome here. Please pray with me. Good and gracious God, you invite us to recognize and reverence your divine image and likeness in our neighbor. Enable us to see the reality of racism and free us to challenge and uproot it from our society, our world, and ourselves. May we rededicate ourselves to this mission during this time of worship. This we pray. Amen. You may be seated. O oh God, who created and loves all people, we come before you today confessing the sin of racism in our country, in our church, and in ourselves. Forgive us for our part in it, for the ways we have contributed to the oppression of others, whether knowingly or unknowingly. We want to be different and for our nation to be different, but it is hard when we face the injustice of institutions as well as the pre prejudice in ourselves. Help us to see the reality of racism and bigotry wherever it exists and to have the courage to challenge it. Through your Holy Spirit, may we be given the grace and power to change within ourselves and also to join with others to do the work of love and justice in the world to move toward the goal of bringing, bringing an end to racism through the name of your son, Jesus, who came for all people. Amen. Please join me in our litany. Lord God Almighty, you brought us to life by your word of truth. We were made in your image, sons and daughters of all colors. The cancerous wickedness of racism has caused your children to suffer. Prejudice, discrimination, and hatred have led to brokenness, violence, and death. We confess that we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We have allowed the sin of racism to divide us in what we have done and what we have not done, what we have said and what we have not said. Purify our hearts and tame our tongues, we pray. Give us courage to repent, to fight for righteousness, and to love and embrace one another. In the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. May you know the peace of Christ in the midst of suffering. May you feel the hope of the Holy Spirit in the midst of injustice. Feel God's love working in your life as you turn to one another and wish the peace of Christ to each other. May the peace of the risen Christ be with you always. A reading from the New Testament, Galatians 3, 23 through 29. Now before faith came, we were imprisoned and guarded under the law until faith would be revealed. Therefore, the law was our disciplinarian until Christ came so that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer subject to a disciplinarian for in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. As many 
of you as were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male and female. For you, for all of you, are one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. Here ends the reading from God's word. Thanks be to God who is still speaking. So why the liturgy today about racism? Throughout the month of July, we will be focusing on our bicentennial theme of our history and its people. And throughout this next year, every month, we'll have a different theme for our bicentennial celebration. What better person to begin with than John Brown as we celebrate our Independence Day, the day we supposedly gained our freedom. Jesus puts it quite plainly. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you, for there is no greater love than this, than to lay down one's life for one's friends. Are you willing to lay down your life for another? What are you willing to die for? This may seem to be a melodramatic question and most certainly hypothetical, right? But is it? I'm willing to assume that for most of us here, we haven't ever really stopped to think about it. What would be important enough to you to be willing to sacrifice your life for it? As far-fetched as the question sounds, it is what Jesus asks of us. This is my command, love one another the way I loved you. This is the very best way to love. Put your life on the line for your friends, he says. Be willing and prepared to lay down your life for those you love. If you love one another with the love of Christ, that is true friendship. And true friendship demands something of us. You are my friends if you do what I command you, Jesus goes on to say. I do not call you servants any longer because the servant does not know what the master is doing. But I have called you friends because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from God, my Father. You did not choose me, but I chose you, and I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, Judy Reese, so that the Father will give you whatever you ask him in my name. I am giving you these commands so that you may love one another. But if the world hates you, Fret not. If the world hates you, be aware that it hated me before it hated you. If you belong to the world, the world would love you as its own. (laughs) But alas, we don't belong to the world. But God has chosen us to live out of this world, and therefore the world hates us. To hate is to fear because hatred is based in fear. And and fear is the opposite of love. We can choose to live out of fear or to live out of love. Those really are the only two options. So if the world hates you because you lead a countercultural life of love, a life committed to following Christ, then that is because the world is scared of what it does not know and does not understand and feels threatened by. Because Jesus' love is a love that shifts the power dynamics and overturns systems of injustice and oppression. The world Jesus is referring to here is the dominant culture. Those making the decisions, those running the show, 
those with the power and the resources. In other words, Jesus is talking to us. In our historical record entitled The Stately Mansion, you're going to hear a lot from The Stately Mansion this month, folks. <laughs> Riveting reading. And it is because it tells the story of one of our most famous congregants. Becky talked about him this morning a bit with the kids, John Brown. A tanner, a leather maker by trade, he and Zenas Kent, sound familiar? built a tannery along the banks of our Cuyahoga River. But unfortunately, their partnership did not last, but we still do have Tannery Park, don't we? In John's honor. While Brown struggled in his business ventures, he was an abolitionist by conviction. That was his divine mission, as he put it. And his story is part of our larger congregational faith story. John Brown was no meek and mild-mannered abolitionist. He was a radical and outspoken social activist determined to end, not tolerate, end the scourge and sin of slavery. He joined this church in February of 1838, back when this congregation met in the old brick meeting house. John's wife, Mary, and many of his sons, he had five altogether, would join the church a few weeks later. That kind of cracked me up. Maybe it was just money to make sure that it was okay before they joined too. I guess uh, that John really wanted to be certain that this was a place he could entrust with his family. Eventually, a pew was named for the Brown family, but John didn't feel comfortable sitting there when the black folks in the church were seated in the back. So one Sunday morning, he escorted that black family to the front of the church, to his family pew. Welcome to the brown pew, folks. The stately mansion goes on to explain that the pastor at the time, the second pastor in our church's history, the Reverend Stephen Burrett, along with the deacons, admonished and labored over, quote, the seating of the colored portion of the congregational audience up front in the Brown family pew. The blacks had been given seats by themselves where the stove stood back near the door. It was not a good place, John Brown said, for seeing the minister or the singers, and not a true view of Christianity. Unquote. Now let me back up because you did hear correctly. The pastor and the deacons were admonishing, scolding John Brown for his actions and then deliberated over where they thought the black folks should sit. Remember, this was the early to mid 1800s. Many in the church as well as other Franklin Mills citizens saw John Brown as quote, a fanatic, unquote, according to our church history. Again, I quote John's gospel when Jesus says, if you find the godless world is hating you, remember that it got its start hating me. If you lived on the world's terms, the world would love you as one of its own. But since I picked you to live on God's terms and no longer on the world's terms, the world is going to hate you. When that happens, remember this. Servants don't get better treatment than their masters. If they beat on me, states Jesus, they will certainly pounce on you. That is the word of God. John Brown's stance on slavery was so clear, so unswerving, so immovable that he was not only called a fanatic and found few friends, he gave his very life for it. He dedicated his life for those he claimed were human beings, radical, but also his friends. Black slaves who were once considered only three-fifths of a person 
John Brown called his sisters and brothers in Christ. That is a radical notion in those days. And I am sad to say, I think many still hold that notion. After fighting for freedom for the black enslaved peoples forcibly brought to this country, including raiding a federal arsenal in Harper's Ferry, what was Virginia, now is West Virginia, John Brown was sentenced to death, and on December 2nd, 1859, he was executed. Jesus puts it plainly, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one greater has love than this, for my love is the greatest, and the greatest love is to lie down one's life for one's friends. According to the history books, quote, although Brown failed to spark a general slave revolt, which was his intention, the high moral tone of his defense helped to immortalize him and to hasten the war that would bring about emancipation. As they marched into battle during the Civil War, Union soldiers sang a song called John Brown's Body that would later provide the tune for the battle hymn of the Republic. John Brown died so that the slaves might be free, but his soul goes marching on. I hope we feel his soul marching on at Kent United Church of Christ. We may have moved from an old brick meeting house, but his soul moves through this place. His intention to end slavery was an inspiration and a model for the Franklin Mills Church. That is to say, this church. And nine years after Brown joined, the church took definite action on the slavery question by adopting and publishing a policy which they believed to be right and regarded it as a duty incumbent on all Christians to show themselves opposed to it and therefore made a very, very clear declaration against slavery. We believe the buying or selling men or holding them in involuntary bondage for the sake of gain is contrary to justice, to humanity, and to Christianity, they wrote. We believe that the system of American slavery is contrary to the spirit and precepts of the Bible. We regard that system as leading naturally and necessarily to sins and evils, too many and too great for language to express. We consider the duty of everyone, and especially of every Christian, to do all he rightly can to remove this sin and evil from our country and the world. We believe that any man who will justify said system of slavery is either too wicked or too ignorant to be a teacher of Christianity, and therefore we would not invite him to preach to us. And on and on. It was then resolved that the above be published in the Ohio Observer and the papers of this county, and they adjourned, closing with prayer. Signed, Clerk Cuthbert. Be careful what you write, Barb Hannaford. Your name will go down in history. <laughs> Kent UCC, this is our history. Joshua Woodard, also a member of this congregation at the time, along with his wife, Rebecca, was the first person, as you heard Becky say, in the Franklin settlement who was known to have helped escaping slaves, part of the Underground Railroad Committee. And he did open up a room in his tavern. Wouldn't it be cool if there was still a tavern instead of a sheets on the corner of Fairchild and Manaway? I could walk there, which was at the foot of Woodard Hill, now Fairchild. That secret room of Joshua's hid many, many a slave while on their way north to Canada for freedom. Kent UCC, this is our history. We stand on the shoulders of such giants of our faith as John Brown and Joshua and Rebecca Woodard. The struggle for justice didn't begin with us. The fight for freedom is not ours alone. 
The passion for peace belonged to our ancestors just as it belongs to us. While the world has changed beyond recognition over the past 160 years since Brown's execution and martyrdom in 1859, Jesus' commandment that we love one another has remained constant. We read the same Bible as those who first gathered in that old brick meeting house. That has not changed, even though God still speaks to us in this time and place. I'm thinking that that message has been the same. As Paul wrote in the letter to the Galatians, there is no longer Jew or Greek, no longer slave or free, no longer male or female. I think Paul knew a bit about transgender identity too, folks. For all of you are one in Christ Jesus. All of us are one in Christ Jesus, no longer slave or free, created equal in the likeness and divine image of none other than God. And yet are we one? Are we one? When a young man of European descent named Jared Stavaglioni marches into a public place in Beaverton, Oregon, high on drugs, creating havoc and causing a scene that will eventually take seven, seven police officers to calm him down. And in the scuffle, the young man takes one of the officer's guns and proceeds to shoot it, but the police officers felt that his life was worth saving, that his life mattered. Because two minutes later, he walks away with nothing but a fine and probation. Meanwhile, little Tamir Rice, who by accident of birth happened to be born black, right here in Cleveland, swinging on a swing and playing with a toy gun, is shot and killed in less than two seconds. As W. Kamau Bell asked in his United Shades of America episode, hashtag living while black, what is the difference between two minutes and less than two seconds? The difference, of course, in America, in the 21st century even, is one boy's white privilege and the other boy's blackness. A blackness that may not have literally enslaved him, but I ask you, how is that freedom? Where your child cannot go out to play. How in the world can that be called freedom? When black boys and girls cannot go outside and swing on a swing without fearing they may be murdered in broad daylight by those supposed to keep them safe. We are not done, my church family, escorting people to our front pews. We are not done making sure that people in this country, the so-called land of the free, are truly free. Amen. We are not done responding to Jesus' commandment to love one another as he loves us until we understand deep in our bones that Tamir Rice is us. Michael Brown is us. Amen. Eric Garner is us. Alton Sterling is us. Philando Castile is us. Sandra Bland is us. Walter Scott is us. Oscar Grant is us. John Crawford is us. Ayanna Jones is us. Trayvon Martin is us. Every single black and brown body in our prism system is us. Every single brown child in a detention center along our border is us. Every single child is our child. These are the enslaved peoples our faith ancestors fought for. These are our siblings in Christ, for whom Joshua Woodard risked his home, business, and family. These are our fellow human beings for whom John Brown gave his life, and we do stand on their shoulders. 
So rise up. Rise up in the name of Christ who came to free us all and make us one. Rise up and demand an end to the mass incarceration of black bodies because they're black. Rise up and demand an end to the criminalization of poor brown children and their families fleeing violence and oppression that we helped to create. It is up to us to free ourselves, my friends, from the bondage of white privilege so that all may live in freedom until we do our work and acknowledge and dismantle the privilege whiteness is. Not only will we never be fully free, certainly our black and brown brothers and sisters will continue to live as captives in the land of the free. Amen. This is our history. This is our work. Will we love one another? Will we, we be a true friend to one another? Will we take Jesus at his word that in him there is no longer slave or free? He puts it quite plainly. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. Throughout this summer, I will open it up for all of us to join in in the prayers of the people so that you will name aloud your, na your joys and your concerns. Let us pray. Holy God, we thank you that your colorful love is revealed in this place, in song, in scripture, in symbol, and in sacrament. Most especially, we see your glory in the faces of one another and in the constantly restored image of God, reflected through those who have laid aside their lives so that they might be made more like Jesus each day. Help us to find ourselves in you, you who made us and you who remakes us, you who called us from the foundation of the earth, who knit us in our mother's womb, who has seen every moment of every day of our lives, who knows the deepest yearnings of our souls, and who will receive us into the arms of mercy when we take our last breath. You have called us to lay down our lives. We have heard your word, God, to be crucified with Christ, to make our lives not about ourselves, but about him and his love You've promised that if we would lay aside our lives, we would find you. You forgive us and our grave sins. And we give ourselves back to you. And we find ourselves in finding you. And we pray now many prayers that we now name aloud. And all this and those that remain silent in our hearts we lift you now, God, as we pray the prayer that your son Jesus taught us to say together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now go into the world recommitted to working for the justice of Christ, recommitted to loving one another to the point of being willing to lay down your life for your friends. I commend to you in this next year a curriculum that we will pursue on white privilege. Our social justice committee will organize that, and I hope that all of you will be a part of that. We will also be looking at more concrete ways to respond to what is going on on our border. So stay tuned for that as well. And last, if you have not done so already, on Harvard University's website, there is a test. It's called the Implicit Bias <coughs> Test. I commend it to all of you. Take 10 minutes of your day, Google harvard.edu implicit bias test, 
and see where you 